Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christa Freeland, Canada's Foreign Minister and your co-host for this wonderful conference. Bonjour tout le monde, ça me fait un grand plaisir d'être ici parmi vous, d'être ici à Londres. Uh, et je veux commencer... I'm very pleased to be in London and I'd like to uh, thank the UK team for the excellent organization of our event. Uh, uh, that I have the privilege of moderating is about the safety and protection of journalists. And we are going to hear from three very brave women uh, who know a lot about working as a reporter in some of the world's most dangerous places. And I have to say, ladies, it's a real privilege for me to share the stage with you today. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the panel, uh, and then I'll ask them some questions and give us all a chance to hear from them. Uh, sitting immediately beside me is Luz Mezirea. She is an investigative reporter in Venezuela and someone who has paid a real price for her brave reporting uh, on a terrible political and humanitarian crisis. So I'm very, very glad to see you here, Luz. Um, beside her is Ma Tida, who is a human rights activist from Myanmar. Uh, and she is also someone who has gone to jail for her convictions and will have an opportunity to talk to us about um, another place where it's difficult to be a reporter. Um, beside her is Rebecca Vincent, uh, I think well known to many people here. Uh, she is the UK Bureau Director of Reporters Without Borders and has worked in lots of difficult places and supported journalists in many of them. Uh, and then farthest away from me, but very close to my heart uh, because of her work in, uh, particularly in Donetsk, is Mariana Katsarova, who is the founder and chair of Raw in War. And she'll tell us a little bit about that. I hope, and about how it was inspired by one of my heroines, Anna Politkovskaya. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with you, Luz. The political and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela has been going on for a long time. Uh, we have just had a chilling report from Michelle Bachelet, more than 5,000 extrajudicial killings uh, that she has documented. Uh, what a difficult place uh, to be someone who is reporting and writing about what is really happening. Um, tell me a little bit about how you had to leave your previous job and what gave you the courage to do the one you're doing now and how you managed to do the work you do in Venezuela. Thank you. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, well, I always ask about if anybody in the audience knows what is uh, cocuyo. Uh, maybe people who speak Spanish, but well, uh, I don't go to ask that. Uh, a cocuyo is like a firefly. So uh, five years ago, my colleague and me, two, uh, two women more, uh, we decided to create this uh, site, investigative site, that called Efecto Cocuyo, and uh, we delivery hard hitting investigation and critical reports that include to report about the humanitarian crisis, investigate about the um, assassination for the uh, public forces and all the situation of human rights uh, violation in Venezuela. Right now, uh, it was like a, a window that we had to go on internet, but right now the government is blocking all the independent sites. So the difficult to to do journalists uh, independent way is that you not only have to deal with a shortage, for example, for the shortage of uh, electricity, food, uh, even money, even cash money, uh, you have to deal with a, uh, a lot of pressure. And sometimes, like in my case, the power point me out uh, as an enemy. So uh, I always try to explain what is happening in Venezuela, uh, giving an example, because this situation begun 20 years ago. This is not new. But now the media industry in Venezuela is totally dismantled. A lot of journalists have to leave the country. More than 600 journalists have to leave the country because if you decide to be an independent journalist, you have to pay a price for that. And we are doing the, our job the, 
try to show what is happening in Venezuela because the situation in Venezuela could be replicable in many other countries. Uh, before the words not about post-truth, about the f alternative fact, that kind of thing happened in my country. How do people get to read your work? I know that there are efforts to block your site from being accessible to people. How do people get access to it? Well, uh, at first, uh, people in Venezuela moved to media social to uh, reach information because the censorship, um, the self-censorship, and uh, now we share a lot of information, but WhatsApp, for example, I don't know if... Uh, on WhatsApp. Know, on WhatsApp, yes. And delivering information even now, with, uh, we go back to our principles, our um, origins, and we are now delivering a uh, print uh, print uh, version about the, the, the uh, issue that we are covering. Because access to the internet is blocked? Yes, because the access to the internet is blocking. People don't have uh, electricity, for example, in so many places. Uh, they don't have uh, uh, the way to, find, to, to look on internet. That kind of situation, by the way, are uh, reported in the, in the last report uh, of the uh, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, when she went to Venezuela, she confirmed a, a lot of what we are saying about the restriction to do our job in Venezuela. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Tida, Canada has uh, recognized the violence against the Rohingya as a genocide. Um, it's truly horrifying what has been done to them. And as you know very well, journalists have gone to jail for daring to report about it. In those conditions, um, how do you find a space to work in Myanmar? Well, I think uh, in order to understand the context of the Myanmar, we need to go back to at least five decades. You know, we got uh, independence in 48, but we do have a very bad laws in 1962. Beyond that, every media should apply license to practice. So license issue turns out to be like the self-censorship. So the Ministry of Information control the license all the time. That's why there was no independent private news media throughout these five decades. So only after 2012 July, there is some independent uh, private news media can practice. So we always depending on the state's run propaganda machine. So people cannot differentiate between the propaganda and the media. And after 1988, a lot of people turn out to be the activists against the military regime. So a lot of, uh, media based outside of Myanmar and they became uh, activism more than the journalism. So people still cannot differentiate what is activism, what is propaganda and uh, journalism. So in this situation, I think the, we all suffer from the syndrome of lack of information. So I think the, all the uh, impressions on the international media also reflecting how much our society have this problem. That's why since we have not much information about ourselves, who else can understand and reflect the reality on the ground? So uh, I feel most of the information reflecting in the international media and other cannot really reach out to the 100% reality on the ground. So in that situation, we're still struggling. That's why I mentioned if we talk about the media <coughs> freedom in Myanmar, we should talk about media ownership. This this is very important because the not just the states but also the army as an institution army have uh, television radio print every single medians of the different medias even though we do have a regulations on the cross ownership but army own all the cross ownership on the other hand uh, media literacy it's matter you know because there was no independent private news media for more than five decades. 
information literacy and media literacy of the general public is pretty much limited. At the same time, since there was no independent media whatsoever until I think the very first one, uh, it was granted under the license of the Ministry of Home Affairs only in 1999. <coughs> so media capacity itself has pretty much limited. So for that reason, I think these three shape the landscape of the media freedom inside Myanmar. So for that reason, it's still very, very struggling. After July 2012, since there was no more censorship, but the propaganda machine is going on through the states, either states media or the army media. And during the military regime, just before they relaxed the censorship and the uh, license issue, license, we still do need to apply license issue. That's why only the uh, family members of the military generals and the tycoons or cronies, they can only have the license. As soon as I was released and I applied to run a, a release health from related, jail. Release from jail. Yeah, I, I applied to run a health related journey as I'm trained as a medical doctor, but I was not granted till now. I have no license whatsoever. So something like that. For that reason, I think the, the currently the, the situation is pretty much challenging, but just uh, before they relaxed all the regulations, the military regime's minister of Ministry of Information had the motto saying that media against media. So they granted a lot of independent media, but the investors, the ownership, it belongs to the cronies or the family members of the generals or the medic, uh, military officers. So in that situation, what we can expect, <laughs> it's hard. People have no idea that they cannot differentiate between uh, the news and the information, a lot of people. So I think uh, that's why in my country case, very be careful about reading the uh, media, uh, the either local or international media. That's why I really encourage just follow more on the academic reports and then the literature. Because during the censorship days, I'm also a uh, short story writer. At that time, we cannot do any journalism whatsoever. So through our short story, through our literature, we try to inform our people what's going on in other part of the country. That's what we have been doing right now. So right now, I think the because of this uh, kind of dynamic media against media, there are so many unidentified independent media. <laughs> we really cannot say it. their media ownership is still matters. So right now, a lot of other media, for example, like Irawadi, DVV, these medias were outside of Burma during the military regime. And after 2012, they came back to Myanmar and they practiced. They really want to run a balanced, impartial media through journalism, but it's a question mark, the survivor. Since the media literacy is pretty much limited, our people cannot be the good readership or the good supporter for the independent media. So it's like the, pretty much the labyrinth and the, the a problem. Vicious, a vicious circle. Yeah, very well, vicious circle. Yeah. Thank you for pointing out the media ownership question. I think um, we discuss it too rarely when we talk about media freedom. Um, one way that Luz talked about in Venezuela getting around some of the restrictions is using new media like WhatsApp. But I think we've seen a very chilling example in Myanmar of use of social media where Facebook was Facebook posts actually were a way that the hatred against the Rohingya was incited and was spread. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, not only the promise that new media offers, but some of those real threats, you know, uh, social media used as an incitement to genocide. Well, I think the, as the motto, media against media, the, throughout the military regime, their aims is to undermine media the image of independent, impartial, uh, private media. So for that reason, you all might notice about the Facebook uh, company's report, they need to delete so many pages and accounts 
because of incitement of the hatreds towards not just to the uh, Rohingya people, but to the any other uh, different diverse groups, a minority. This happens because the, this can make uh, so much instability inside country and there will be the rule for the security forces. <laughs> you know, that, that's the logic behind. So I think- They are seeking to create instability in order to have a job? That's, yeah, according to our experience, we can say this. So <laughs> in that case, I think the whole, uh, accounts, so many accounts and uh, uh, social media pages under the title of news media, most of these are not real news media. This is just design. And for example, like there are so many military intelligence and the informers, they have been employed under the military regime, but right now they have been uh, getting together under the title of the Reporters Association. And they, they became the reporter. So they having the catalyst to the local people to threat the local business people not to write or to write. They need to bribe them, something like that. So in order to uh, undermine the image of the independent private media, the, the, the one who wants having the power uh, to uh, glorify themselves, they have so many ways and so many plans to undermine the media and to make the society and people confused. Mm -hmm. So they use so many ways, the racial, religious, or any kind of the discriminations in order to make the people in pretty much confusion and then the undermining the media. That's why a lot of people, the, the grassroots people, their perspective towards independent media is not very positive right now. Because the propaganda has worked. Yeah, that's why we used to say media right now is tunnels to be the common enemy. I think that is a danger that reporters in many countries are experiencing. Yeah. So Rebecca, um, your job is to make it a little bit easier, maybe ideally a lot easier, um, for women like Luz, like Tida, to do their work as reporters. What can you do to help them? Well, first expose actually what's happening and what we're noticing is a global deterioration of press freedom. So it's actually never been more dangerous than it is now to be a journalist. Uh, 2018 was one of the deadliest years on record for media around the world. Um, our data showed 80 cases of journalists, citizen journalists and media workers who were killed. And that trend um, unfortunately shows no signs of abating. This year we've already had 20 journalists murdered so far in 2019. Um, as we sit here as well, 341 journalists are in prison around the world. Most of these are concentrated in a handful of countries. We're looking at China, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran. These are countries that consistently have a very high number of journalists in prison. So on a basic level, we need to be continuing to expose these cases, but also uh, states need to take their protection role more seriously. So it's great that everybody's gathered here today. It's always nice to have these moments to talk about media freedom. We welcome states reaffirming their commitment to media freedom, but these are obligations that are already exist. Uh, every state here has actually already ratified a number of international agreements that spell out these obligations and in fact this is enshrined in, in your own national laws but what we're seeing is a failure really to, to implement this in practice in many places. So in some places that's a, an issue of the state needing to do more to sort of protect journalists at risk but in other places it's the states themselves that are causing the threat to journalists. So I think we need to do better at an, as an international community and in having an honest discussion about uh, the cause of these problems and, and how to address it. And that sometimes includes very uncomfortable conversations among states that have good relations in other areas. Um, it certainly does. Um, and I think, you know, I had breakfast uh, with Jeremy Hunt this morning and one of the ideas that brought us together uh, in co-hosting uh, this conference and Canada's gonna host it next year, we hope this will become an annual event, is those are uncomfortable conversations. And as foreign ministers, we believed and believe that if we can get a group of like-minded countries together, 
that agree together to consistently raise these cases, we can be more effective and it creates more space for each country to act when you're not acting alone. So that is one of the results that we hope that we can deliver from this conference. You started off by saying something, Rebecca, that I think is really important, which is it's actually getting worse. Do you have ideas of why that is? Well, it is a global deterioration and unfortunately it's, not, it's no longer just in the places that we've thought of as traditionally being the worst offenders. It is happening in democracies now. Um, you may be familiar with our World Press Freedom Index, uh, which at a glance you can see 180 countries ranked in terms of their performance on press freedom. What you don't see at a glance is that the whole world is getting worse. Um, we are seeing countries that have been thought of as standard setters slipping here in the UK. It's no different. This is a conversation we have here quite a lot. We're 33rd out of 180 countries now on the index. And and we do welcome the conversation that we're having with, uh, with the British government now about how to improve this. Um, but some countries in the EU have, have dropped even sharper. Uh, for example, in Malta, we're dealing with impunity for the assassination of a journalist uh, for nearly 21 months now. This is in the EU. A journalist was blown up in a car, by a car bomb in broad daylight in an EU state, and still we have impunity. Um, when impunity is happening, even in the countries that have, have been thought of as standard setters, that have been thought of as part of this club of like-minded countries, that's a really worrying signal for everywhere else. So really we have to, I think, be honest as well about our own records. And I think that shouldn't prevent states from talking to other states about their commitments as well. But we have to bear in mind uh, that in, actually no state is perfect. No state has a per uh, perfect press freedom record. Even those countries at the very top, we can point to examples. But when it comes to safety in, a p in particular, uh, that is crucial. And we need to find a way to start to chip at this impunity for nearly every murder of a journalist that we see. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm sad that our transition is speaking of murders of journalists, but um, Mariana has been very inspired in her life work by a tragic murder of a journalist, Anna Politkovskaya. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and what you have done in her memory. Well, actually, this morning, um, coming to this building for the first time in my life, I was um, really pleasantly surprised, but also in a way saddened and empowered by seeing on one of those um, big, I don't know what they are, containers, metal containers, a quote from Anna Politkovska. And that was the first thing one sees coming to this conference today. Um, what matters is not, uh, what matters is the information and not what you think about it. Um, and I think this is why we're here. Uh, we're here because um, uh, friends and colleagues of ours like Anna Politkovskaya in so many countries around the world, what Rebecca was talking about, like our friends from um, present in this panel, they are under threat uh, as we sit in this room today. And they're under threat because they uphold this principle of impartiality, of independence of the media, of what matters is the information and not our personal opinions, not our political belongings. And because they they really uh, seek the truth and, and try to expose the truth. Anna was a total truth seeker. Um, she was a very um, modest and very well organized person. Uh, you would never hear from her, um, you know, kind of uh, emotional speak. Um, the only time I saw Anna crying was the day I happened to be there at the border of um, between Chechnya and Ingushetia when she came out um, after her meeting with uh, the president of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov. And at that meeting, he threatened her. Uh, he wanted his armed guards to actually catch her in the middle of the conversation. And the only person who saved her was uh, another dear friend and colleague of ours, Chechen activist and journalist, freelance journalist, Natalia Stemirova. She used her, it was a bit tricky, but Natalia used her status as an older Chechen woman in the a kind of patriarchal society of Chechnya, where she said to uh, President Kadyrov, I'm an older Chechen woman, you now, uh, young man, need to listen to me. So leave Anna Politkovska, let us uh, come out of here safe. Which, of course, was, Natalia was completely shattered. Anna was, Anna was, uh, I, I saw her crying for the first time. 
On Monday, this coming Monday, we um, tragically mark the 10 years anniversary since Natalia was murdered. I think Mr. Kadyrov didn't really forget that elder, older Chechen woman ordering him around. And um, on, in 2009, on 15th of July, she was abducted in front of her home. And three hours later, um, she was found, her body was found um, shot um, in Ingusheti, in the neighboring country to Chechnya. Uh, Natalia very much continued in the steps of Anna. Anna, obviously, there was so many attempts on her life. Uh, she was uh, poisoned um, on, on the way, in, in the airplane on the way. Uh, to um, Ossetia, where she was trying to actually negotiate the hostage crisis in the school. Uh, but clearly, the authorities didn't want uh, a peaceful resolution, so uh, she was poisoned on the way, on the way there. Um, she barely survived. She was also captured on a Russian military base earlier. She survived mock executions, which all of these, um, all through, um, uh, you know, the first and Chechen, especially the, the second Chechen war, which uh, Anna stepped in and became the only voice, the only journalist, really, um, from Russia who was um, covering um, the torture, the murder of civilians in Chechnya, the rapes of women by um, Russian federal forces. So, of course, she was, she was killed to be punished. I worked at Amnesty International during that time as the Russia researcher. So, Anna was very often our case and our uh, uh, person to look for um, in, in Chechnya when she would disappear or when she was, um, when she was captured on the military base. Um, then uh, followed Natalia, and then several other uh, human rights defenders in Russia was killed shortly after. Um, I think honoring, I mean, what I did in my small way with my colleagues was after Anna was murdered, um, and it happened on the birthday of Mr. Putin, uh, 7th of October 2006, somehow, strangely. Um, when Anna was murdered, I thought, this is really anger-making. Um, she was killed um, only for being the voice of the civilians in Chechnya and being Russian herself, and actually from quite a privileged uh, diplomatic family. Anna didn't need to put herself in danger. She could have lived in one of those Stalinist um, Visotka um, skyscraper in Moscow um, and be quite well and, and just be a journalist writing about a ballet or Bolshoi theater, but she herself couldn't, uh, um, could, could not, not go to Chechnya. It was almost a matter of, that's what she said, there's no way that I can just sit in Moscow and witness what's happening uh, to the people of Chechnya. So she went, um, and it wasn't comfortable, and that's why she was punished, that's why she was silenced. I uh, thought the only way we could actually honor Anna and all these other um, women journalists and human rights activists, citizen journalists, freelance journalists, um, human rights defenders that at the moment are risking their lives is to set up an award. And I set up an award uh, in the name of Anna Politkovskaya. Um, the first winner was Natalia Stemirova. In 2007, the good friend of Anna, the good colleague who was working in Memorial, the, Russian, uh, the biggest Russian human rights organization. So um, this award by now has been given to a lot of um, remarkable women. You know, I, yesterday in preparation of our panel, I just looked at our award winners and I mean, really, again, it, it uh, came home to me. So many of them are already dead. Some are abducted. Um, and, and this is the sort of truth seekers that um, received the Anna Politkovska Award. Why not men? Why women? Because usually in war and conflict zones, this is an award for women from 
journalists and human rights defenders from war and conflict zones around the world. Usually in conflict, the men are either fighting, they're imprisoned, or they're dead. So it's actually the women that uh, keep the, the, the society going. They're the activists, they're the 80% of the victims, of the refugees, the journalists, the voices, the peacemakers. And obviously, in the end of a conflict, unfortunately, we must say um, it's um, when um, the men are coming back home, uh, the women are not even invited around the peace table in, in neither of the armed conflicts that we, current armed conflicts that we're trying to bring peace. And risking to uh, kind of insult the guys in the audience, but I'm wondering. Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, if you guys can take it okay. with us. Um, I wonder whether that's why we don't have peace, because the women that actually the people, the human beings that were keeping the society going, that were the victims, that were the voices risking their lives while the men were fighting, then are not invited to come up with a solution of this conflict. And we need a serious uh, uh, look at that situation. Um, and then we need a serious look at the situation of as Rebecca mentioned, um, I mean, my impression is the international, we, the international community, governments, uh, non-governmental organizations, journalists, are we really able or we're just really, um, it seems, um, can I use the word impotent or, um, we cannot save even one journalist, even one human rights defender who is endangered. We uh, pour money sometimes, lately, uh, 50 million, uh, as, as far as I know, has been given to, the, to set up the EU uh, Human Rights Defenders Protection Mechanism. It's a great idea, but when you go to that website, it says, if you're a threatened human rights defender, please drop us a line. Here is the email. Um, at the moment, another winner of the Anna Politkovska Award, very much a remarkable young woman in the north of Pakistan, Gulalai Ismail, only 31 years old, who actually was the mentor of Malala Yousafzai. You remember Malala, who got the Nobel Peace Prize. When Malala was 10, it was Gulalai and her sister Saba who set up this organization, Aware Girls, and they were working with young people in the north of Pakistan to dissuade them to join Taliban, because there is apparently some romanticism going of becoming freedom fighters among young people. And Recently, last month, there was a murder, a rape and a murder of a 10-year-old girl in Islamabad. So, of course, Gulalai was the first to go to a rally and speak about uh, police, um, that the police, uh, the police in action, about impunity in these cases, about the war economy, actually, that produces the impunity, and then family members, uh, common criminals, could allow themselves this violence, uh, sexual violence against children, against women, because they can, because there is an impunity. Well, what happened? Instead of uh, the authorities really listening to uh, Gulalai, um, and to the other activists, she was immediately uh, charged uh, under the terrorism laws in Pakistan. She was charged with uh, sedition, with inciting hatred. Yulalai has been in hiding in the past um, three, three weeks, over three weeks. Her family has been terrorized, uh, including a few days ago, uh, a new raid in their home uh, where their driver was taken away, uh, apparently tortured by uh, law enforcement to reveal um, where, you know, what, where are the whereabouts of Gulalai Ismail. Now, I just came from um, uh, several weeks lobbying in New York, the UN, lobbying in Geneva, at the Human Rights Council, raising the case of Gulalai with government officials, with colleagues from NGOs. Nobody could do anything. You know, we cannot save her. We cannot, it seems, we, we don't have still the mechanisms to actually stop the, the death threat on her, to ensure safety for her. And really, sadly, I must say, if we are unable to protect one young woman who had the courage to have her voice heard, about the rape and the murder of a 10-year-old girl. Shame on us all. I mean, if we cannot, as international community, as six or seven billion on this planet, to stand for one 
voice. Then, I mean, how can we live with ourselves and what can we do? So, um, it's courageous that we're having this forum today and I want to commend the government of Canada and the UK. I also have hope when uh, journalists are becoming uh, foreign ministers. I think it's a reason to celebrate because um, one of us, uh, a human rights advocate, I must say, uh, for many years and a journalist and a brave voice like you, Christia, is now the Foreign Minister of Canada. So we can talk to each other because we have the same language, the language of human rights. Um, so I really look forward to this forum to come up with practical steps. The commitments are there, uh, the UN uh, covenants are there, uh, the UN Special Rapporteurs are here uh, as part of this uh, forum. But can we come up with a concrete steps, which are not just please write to our email if you're threatened, to save the Annas and Natalias and Gulalais of today that are threatened as we sit here in London today? Okay, well, I think, I'm, that, yeah, let's give her a hand. Get ready because my concluding question for everyone at the end of the panel is going to be what's the one concrete step? And, and I think, Mariana, that's exactly right. Um, on going from being a journalist to a politician, let me say I've decided it's easier to ask the questions than to give the answers. Um, and I'm quite delighted to be in the question asking role for a few moments right now. Um, it was very moving to hear all of you speak, and maybe just now, Mariana. Um, talking about uh, women like Anna, uh, women like Yula Lai, uh, and the kind of courage it takes to keep on doing the work when you've already been in danger. And that's what I wanted to ask you about, Luz. Like, you talked about hundreds of journalists having to leave Venezuela because of threats they face or simply because uh, their publications have been shut down. Um, what keeps you going? What makes you go back and keep doing this work? It's an easy answer, I think so, that because uh, we always say that we are journalists and we, we demand to ourselves to tell the story that is happening in Venezuela. A lot of journalists are there and <clears throat> they are covering the stories and they tell into the world there is a country that is fighting for democracy, to go back the democracy. So I think that the journalists that we are in Venezuela, uh, they are doing a very brave job. Right now, I don't know when I come back to my country because I, uh, I have to leave my country for security reasons, but I have is to it, go back. Is it dangerous for you to go back? Yes, it's, it's dangerous for me to go back to Venezuela um, in the time <coughs> I would like to stay there. But I, I'm sure that I go back. I'm not sure if I'm go uh, if I, I going to go to jail. I, I'm not sure about that. But uh, what uh, I'm sure is that they are going to point us as an enemy. And it's happened always. And what I want to emphasize here is that this story began 20 years ago. And the international community by that time, didn't pay some uh, attention because they believe that was, you know, this kind of confrontation between the power and the media and the journalists. But what we have now, this is an example, a bad example, that the formula to reduce democracy and media and journalists work, really works. We can, we hear, we listen in the uh, experiences and we know that they, they attack you, they undermine your credibility, they, um, avoid that uh, a very vigorous uh, ecosystem of free media works in this context and they kill journalists but they not only kill journalists with a gun they kill journalists uh, in credibility they kill journalists when they they attack journalists and this journalist had to leave the country for example because the family feel that the life of this journalist is in, in danger so I think that uh, we, we bring here a uh, bad example about how the formula works, but I, what I want to emphasize and repeat is that this formula really works. Uh, 
you've depressed me so much. It's hard <laughs> for me to go on. We're going to have to try to find ways to reverse the formula. Um, and that's what I'd like to ask Tita about, because I think we all had a moment of tremendous hope in Myanmar that after a dark period of dictatorship, the formula was actually being reversed. And I think we are seeing how difficult it is to do that. And, you know, with uh, the genocide of the Rohingya, that even after what we saw was this very bright moment for Myanmar, an extremely dark moment could come. Do you have any guidance for us on reversing the formula, on how do you rebuild a society in a country that has been so crushed? Well, we do have so many conflicts, not just in the uh, Arakan states. Right now, the Arakan army, the Rakhine Buddhist army, has been fighting against the state's army very fiercely, so much fiercely. So we do have more than 70 years civil war, and at least five out of 14 states and divisions is having the civil war right now. So that's, that's just, I, I really want the whole war focus more on the so many different conflicts at the same time, not just particular one. And I think uh, we need to uh, start from the constitutional reform and which is going to be happen <laughs> might not be as we expected, but it's the now, right now at the parliament, people are talking about the constitutional reform because the, according to the current constitution, the media freedom or the freedom of expression has never been granted according to this constitution. And all of the existing laws has been pretty much manipulated. You know, we have been talking a lot about the uh, telecommunication law, Article 666D, in order to sue not just journalists, human rights defenders, and the civilians. Then they shift to the other telecommunications law, Article 34D or some other. Still keep suing the uh, journalists and the civilians and human rights defenders. So we do have so many different is this is law which can prohibit freedom of expression and media freedom. And we do have a news media law, but that news media law cannot protect any journalists. And there is no right to information law yet. Then we cannot claim any data or information transparently from any institution, including uh, the army and the states. So. I think the, we do need to work on the law level. Another big one is institutional level. There was only one and only associations on behalf of writers and the journalists throughout socialists and the military government. So people really don't know what is institution. That's the big challenge right now. So people just thinking of having a group of the people like a gang <laughs> in order to propagate its own principle to overwhelm or to uh, override anything they really aim for, something like that. So I think the, we do need to seriously think about uh, institutional reform as a media, that, that's so much needed. A lot of the, uh, even though we do have, for example, like the press concert, it's never turned out to be an independent ombudsman because the law itself is not very supportive to become the independent ombudsman, but the people perspectives towards this kind of the self-regulating independent ombudsman body is pretty much nothing. They have no idea. So I think, uh, Right now, civil society organizations, some very impartial independent private media and journalists are trying a lot to refine or define, redefine what's the freedom of expression and uh, media freedom inside the society first. Then I think it would take time, definitely. I used to say a lot of our people, because of five decades censorship, propaganda, and poor education system, our people don't know what they don't know. That's the serious problem.
So right now, I think we still need so many years to overcome so many different problems, but I, I normally don't want to give uh, any hopes <laughs> because yeah, we believe, yeah, we deserve freedom. We deserve the democracy. We deserve media freedom. So we sh always uh, find so many different ways, but we try to uh, share the knowledge about the past and what's going on to the people, until and unless they have not been encouraged. The, the active, <coughs> responsible citizenships can be the only catalyst for going forward. That's why we pushing the boundary, not just through the media, but also through the civil society organizations, so and so on. Yes, ultimately it's up to all of us, isn't it? Sure. So we've heard Rebecca from TIDA some approaches that might work. I would love to hear from you. Does your media freedom list work? Do countries not like being at the bottom? Do countries like being at the top? I mean, I assume that part of the motivation in creating it is to give us governments a little bit of incentive to do better. Is that working? Well, as a tool, it is intended to be an advocacy tool, not just to name and shame, but actually to start conversations with states about what they can do better. But I want to caveat this with, it is a snapshot of the entire press freedom climate in a country, so not just the behavior of governments themselves, although of course the behavior of governments um, has a strong influence often on the press freedom situation in these countries. Um, I have to say the only country that I have been to that has not complained about their ranking is Norway, which is currently number one on the index. Um, even within the top 10, there's a bit if questioning about what is Norway doing better. Countries certainly do not like being at the bottom of the index. Um, Reporters Without Borders just revealed this morning that we actually took a, an unprecedented mission to Saudi Arabia in April. They certainly did not like their score. They uh, this year have slipped into the bottom 10 for the first time at 172nd out of 180 countries. Uh, and that was a perception, you know, the Saudi authorities really didn't like that. They did not view themselves as so close to countries even further down the list um, as we do when we're objectively looking at the situation. It's not just the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, but also 30 journalists remain in prison. It is horrific, and that's why we went to the country, but there are also 30 journalists at least uh, that remain behind bars there. So, But countries in the middle often grumble as well, even these democracies. And so, uh, But that's exactly it, is that we want to have these conversations. Um, we want to, to identify areas that we can improve, um, and often it is the countries in the middle that are more honest about things that they can do better. It tends to be countries that view themselves as, as being a bit better than they are. And, and people also don't often realize that there's a bit of a national bias sometimes in looking at it. I think we all have this internal kind of reaction about how we think the state of things in our own countries are. But when we look at things objectively, um, there are areas for improvement everywhere, even in Norway, I have to say. Okay, and what is so great about the Norwegians? I think we want to know so, what makes well, them so Well, do you know so what? Often the Scandinavian special. countries perform very well. I think you don't have things, you don't, you have an environment that just allows for, uh, for freedom of expression. You don't have murders of journalists. You don't have uh, so often laws that are extremely restrictive. Um, um, the, the press is largely able to operate as it should. Um, so there's, there's seven different indicators in our index. Sometimes the reason for poor ranking is di very different country to country. It can be uh, problematic legislation. Sometimes in areas that don't look on the surface to be connected to press freedom. Uh, for example, things being done in the name of national security that trample press freedom. That's often an issue in democracies, right? Um, it can be physical threats. It can be the environment uh, around, uh, for example, the financing of media. media. Media ownership has been mentioned all of these things. It can be very different country to country, uh, the reasons for these rankings. But there are lessons that can be learned from each other. And some things are very country specific, but there are best practices. And we are happy to have these conversations with governments. And I know our like-minded, uh, our friends from other like-minded NGOs are as well. And I hope that's what we can do over the next day and a half that we've got left here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Mariana, as you were talking um, about Chechnya, uh, I couldn't help but think about an interview um, in my alma mater newspaper, the FT, that Vladimir Putin uh, gave recently, uh, where he was very candid uh, and said that in his view the liberal idea is dead. Um, you've worked a lot in Russia. 
Is it dead in Russia? Has this system that Luz talked to us about, has it really worked there? Um, are there still Anna Politkovskas left? Anna Politkovska is left, and 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 what can they do? Um, and he wasn't referring only to Russia, by the way. He said it's dead for all of us. But I'm, I want right. you to focus on where is the Russian delegation. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, even if there are Anna Politkovskas, we would never probably find out about them because. Um, the stifling of civil society and um, independent media has been uh, done right now on such a sophisticated level, I would say, in Russia, and not only in Russia, but there. Um, How about Ivan Golunovno? That really cheered me up. <laughs> yes, right. Um, this, was, this was the Russian journalist who was, seemed like he was being framed, and then Russian journalists themselves organized very quickly and they let him go. Yes, I think uh, there is a whole machine of disinformation working and I'm afraid, I think, um, organized possibly by uh, the government authorities uh, to make sure that uh, there are no other Anna Politkovskas and there are no other Natalia Stemirovas. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a former journalist myself and I worked during the communist times in my, my own country, Bulgaria. Um, and then I was part of the group that started uh, the first independent newspaper in Bulgaria called Democracy. And I remember that um, after the changes, after the Berlin Wall fell, there were so many of my former colleagues who were actually forced in uh, the communist newspaper that sacked me for, um, in 1988 for a couple of publications um, that weren't very you know, uh, Communist Party oriented. Um, so my colleagues were forced in 10 minutes to vote for me to be uh, fired from this newspaper, otherwise they will follow. So these colleagues, after the changes, and it became kind of cool to be, you know, uh, a dissident minded or a, a democratically minded, they came to me and apologized. And they said, look, we had families, we had children, we can't, we couldn't be brave like you. You were young, you didn't have anybody, so maybe that's why you were brave. <laughs> um, <laughs> By the way, both uh, Anna and Natalia had uh, uh, children, uh, Natalia too, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Anna too, and um, Natalia daughter, that after her murder, we, um, my colleagues from Regional Women in War, we took here in England and educated, we collected money and educated her um, in the UK. She just graduated from LSE uh, in international relations. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe she's the next uh, foreign minister of, let's see which country. Um, but um, back to Russia and back to your question. I don't think it's only Mr. Putin that sends a signal that the liberal idea is dead. I think um, looking at Saudi Arabia with the Khashoggi case, looking at uh, so many at the moment cases, uh, looking at what's happening in Donetsk, looking at um, you know the situation in eastern Ukraine, which doesn't have any independent media, let alone any NGOs, and I was there for stationed there for two years, um, leading the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission. I was the head of office for Donbass. Every day, almost there was uh, disinformation campaigns and fake news, and obviously um, we were producing the reports that were informing uh, the UN Security Council, the the UN system, on what measures to take. So I was going with my team after every fake news, and I remember one of them was um, about Respiate Malchik, about the crucified uh, da, da, da. baby boy. So uh, that was done uh, allegedly by Ukrainian army that crucified this child in Donbass. So I, at that time, had uh, established, um, you know, um, professional relations with um, the, the, minister, the so-called ministers of the so-called Donetsk uh, uh, and Lugansk People's Republics. So I remember calling the Minister of Interior of, Dunet of the Lugansk Republic because this uh, crucified Mal Malchik uh, uh, boy was supposed to happen in Lugansk. 
Um, and I said to him, we're here, we're ready to come, we're ready to meet the family of this boy, we're ready to see the dead body, we're ready to investigate to the last bit this case, because the world needs to know this is a horrible atrocity against the child. Um, you claim, your authorities claim it happened by the Ukrainian side. We're not taking sides, we're the United Nations Human Rights Mission. And, and, and that's true, we were uh, completely independent, the mission continues. Um, our duty was to inform the UN system and the world. He said, yes, Mariana, I will uh, definitely put you in touch with the family um, and I will talk to the morgue so you can see and examine the body. A day passes, a second, a third. Um, I called the minister, I said, but, but this is really urgent. Uh, we need to see, we need to investigate. So then it started to unravel. Well, the family doesn't want to talk. They're in deep grief. Uh, the body actually has been moved somewhere to further analysis. Um, you're a civilian mission. You cannot really uh, see it. So, but do we have the time in the world uh, as human rights investigators, as journalists, uh, to actually unravel every disinformation when there are huge machines and half of the people here are government authorities, maybe in your countries, maybe you yourself set it up. Um, this kind of uh, trolls, I mean, by the way, the Bulgarian hackers are the best in the world, I, I just want to say. Um, this is our infamous, um, one of legends about the Bulgarian hackers, we're very good with, with computers. But um, this is impossible because we will have these lone voices of activists and journalists trying to unravel the disinformation, the liberal voices, and then we will have governments, and not always the, the ones we think, oh, they're a baddies, you know, they really kill journalists. In my country, Bulgaria, uh, journalists go to prison. Some journalists are killed, by the way, and it's a member of the EU. Um, I mean, it's a good question. Who is a baddie and who is a goodie uh, here? And We know about the Norwegians. I think yeah, the, the Norwegians, I think it's too field. cold to even go out and be bad. But um, So I think, where are the Politkovskas, the Estemirovas, um, today, um, I'm sure they are here, and I'm sure they are, um, you know, the young women who sees, the, the young girls who actually are growing and seeing the example, seeing forums like this, I hope they dream to become another Anna Politkovskaya, and we... With a happier our, ending. It's our With responsibility to nurture them, yeah. and not to, you know, target them for disinformation and to scare them to become these brave voices. Our time is coming to an end, and I've been told very sternly by the British co-hosts we must end on time. We have exactly 53 seconds left. I'd like each person to just give me one, you've, you've all been very eloquent on the need for us to actually do some concrete things to make it better. I agree with that a thousand percent. I think talking is important. I mean, words do matter, but we need to actually find some ways to fight back. Could each of you name one specific thing that you'd like us to do? Luz. <clears throat> well, I think the, um, you have, uh, the international community have to focus uh, on what happened in our country, for example, and have uh, a lot of journalists that they have to stay there without anything uh, in shortage uh, situation. Uh, I think that we need more help and more um, the people being more aware about the situation in our countries, not only in Venezuela, in America also. Okay, thank you. Tida. Well, I think the in-depth uh, knowledge about the whole complexity of the country will help everyone or every institution or every country to understand more about what are the ways to go ahead that that will be because our issue is so much complex that's why i think the until and unless we don't dig enough into the problems we we will end up the so much superficial cont, uh, just temporary solution that's why i prefer the international community uh, learn deeper into the complexity and then help the citizens, non-state actors to contribute more on having the, the global media freedom. 
Okay, thank you, Rebecca. An easy one, maybe not so much, and impunity for crimes against journalists, in particular the murders of journalists. Too often the obstacle is simply a lack of political will to properly investigate these crimes, to identify everybody involved in every aspect from the planning and carrying out of the attack to the masterminds, importantly the masterminds behind these attacks. So uh, we need the political will to really address this and the political will from other states to really uh, hold other states to account for this. Um, too often we just sort of go along with the status quo and turn a blind eye to states that are failing uh, to prosecute um, those who are murdering journalists. Okay, here, here. Um, when talking about uh, journalists' um, safety, don't forget um, at the same time to talk about the safety of the human rights activists who are often the freelance journalists or the sources for the professional journalists and that's why they're targeted. I think one concrete effort um, would be to set up a very high level urgent group of foreign ministers or the level of prime ministers, maybe the presidents of countries, where you will have your mobile phones. And if there is a, a case of a threatened human rights defender or a journalist, uh, immediately take action between you to, um, to kind of to, uh, um, provide protection. Think, be flexible in providing, I recently heard um, from some diploma, uh, one diplomat, there is nothing like temporary asylum. Well, maybe there should be. We need new tools, flexible tools for providing protection of the journalists, threatened ones and human rights defenders. Because not everybody, and actually a very little group of activists and journalists want to be living in another country. They want to be back in their country after the threat uh, stops, ends. So, and please do something for Gulalai Ismail in the north of Pakistan. Here is one test for all of us who okay. is under threat. Well, thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tita. Thank you, Luz. Could we all give a hand to these very brave, very committed women? Well, let's try to act on all these things. I think our panel has now concluded and there's gonna be another one soon. Thank you very much.